Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Paulette, for the chance to, uh, to do this today, to talk to people at what is really such an important time in the evolution of our species, the transformation of our planet, our coming into more collective consciousness about our ability to change and direct the world as we intend. Uh, and so before we, begin, we get into that whole subject, which is very much related to what I do as an astrologer, um, it's useful maybe to say a little bit, just to, just to introduce myself here. We are, we are in the town of Pisac, Peru, which is in the Sacred Valley near Cusco, uh, and uh, which was, as uh, many people know, the, the capital of the Inca civilization that was here. And um, it's a wonderful place to be right now, and a very attractive people, a very attractive place, I should say, that magnetizes so many people from different parts of the planet, because it's an extremely abundant environment in terms of the biodiversity here, the healthiness of the environment, with pure food, and pure water, and amazing varieties of uh, of foods, thousands of kinds of potatoes and so on, hundreds of kinds of tomatoes and pumpkins. The reason why the people of Peru have been able to maintain this kind of amazing natural health and vitality is that they have a philosophy which is called Aini, which would translate in one word as reciprocity, but could be translated in another way as helping nature do what she wants to do with the understanding, then, that she is going to return the favor by blessing us with an abundance of good food and good health. So this, therefore, represents a traditional and very healthy and sacred idea of relationship between human beings and our planet so that we are part of a holistic system in which we are giving something to the health of the whole, and this is naturally a desirable and very fascinating alternative that we have today to the kind of rapacious behavior that has been going on with companies and more imperialistic countries taking and ruining whatever they can for their profit without regard for the consequences. So it is no wonder that every year this civilization becomes better known and it becomes more attractive and more and more people understand every year who the mother goddess Pachamama is and why she's so important. Uh, and so whatever I can contribute to the furthering of this process, I am honored and delighted to do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am American-born. I was born in New York in September of 1944. So I'm a Virgo, uh, now 71 years old. I uh, am still an American citizen, but I have not lived on the American mainland now for... Uh, longer than many of the people who will see this video have been on the earth. I, uh, I left there in 1984, and so since then I have lived in, in Kyoto, Japan, uh, also in Hawaii, also in Egypt, now in Peru. I travel extensively, um, partly because I love to visit different sacred sites and cultural destinations, because I do lecture tours, and I do tours of readings uh, of astrology in my specialty, which is called astrocartography, which I'll tell you about in a moment. People naturally want to know how I got into this. And the honest answer is, it's a woman, of course. What else is going to take a hyper-intellectual, arrogant man, knock him off his position of presumption to an understanding that he has not got the world figured out nearly as much as he thought. Um, and so the understanding of, uh, of what astrology represents, really, um, has, uh, uh, has been with me ever since. Uh, I, I first began to study it, what, 37 years ago? Uh, and so by, it was obvious at once that, ooh, this is telling me something that is quite true and accurate about who I am and what my tendencies, my talents, my experiences, my possibilities are. And since then, it's not a matter of belief. 
It's a matter of accepting the obvious if one is willing to do that. So the variety of astrology that I specialize in uh, is called astrocartography, and we're going to talk about this for a little while, and I'll show you a couple of actual maps that give you a good idea of what this involves. Uh, and you'll be able to see them on the video screen itself. You see, what it, what it entails is that it takes the information that any astrologer uses to cast your horoscope wheel, which many of you have seen, uh, and instead of creating the horoscope wheel, it creates a world map and then you can zoom into different specific locations within the map that you want to explore. And each place is going to have its own specific arrangement of colored planet lines that represent things like your money, your job, your health, your family relationships, your creative path, your spiritual practices, your love life. Uh, and all of these things, therefore, can identify places in the planet that are good for living and working um, to address these objectives that are most important to you and they also can identify places where important relationships are waiting for you you see so that the if you have an astrocartography reading done and I and I recommend to you a place that's really advantageous for you you don't necessarily have to move there but it might be in your advantage to build relationship with people in that place. This is how you can find investors, colleagues, clients, publishers, and so on that could be of real practical advantage to you. So I'm going to show you a couple of, of maps right now that are specific ones. The first one is my map of Peru, and it shows you why I'm here, why, why this is one of the best places in the world for me because it has a number of different lines here, some of which are really advantageous by themselves, like these two lines, the yellow one for the sun and the green line for the planet Chiron. What they represent, the sun, is creativity, life force, vitality, leadership, gaining recognition, and the green Chiron line is a health line. So this is a location where I seem to attract successful results, really good relationships with people all over the world, and where I also become healthier. I have relationship with many brilliant healers in this place, and I do my own sound medicine work in this place too. Every line in the map has a range of 300 miles to either side. So in the place where I am now, I'm living between two powerful lines that are about 20 miles apart. You can imagine how powerful this is and how advantageous it is for me. The other place that you see on the map is up here that I'm showing you now. This is on the north coast of Peru um, in this area which is somewhat a little bit below the border with Ecuador. You see two lines crossing here. The blue one is a Jupiter line which is a money, prosperity, success, power line. And the other one is a purple line for the planet Uranus, which represents changes, revolutionary events, innovation, electronic technology. And where these two lines cross, this is supposed to be, in the classic interpretations of astrocartography, your best place in the world, or one of them. This is what Jim Lewis, the creator of the system, called your unique magical good luck zone. And so this is where I went during a rainy season here to sort of get out of the rain in the Andes and go up there on this northern beach area. So not surprisingly, I was completing a book in that place. I did a lot of work, not only for clients in other places, which is most of the work that I do by Skype, but also for people there locally. And I had good relationships with powerful people in that environment, movers and shakers who offered me just advantageous conditions there. And you got to be careful under a Jupiter line, too, because Jupiter is hearty appetites and overindulgence. So you will tend to gain weight in that kind of environment unless you're doing a lot of swimming and walking and other things that'll, that'll, uh, that'll exercise your body. So this is a typical map here. You see, in the sense that you see this different um, arrangement of the planet lines, but it's not typical. 
in the sense that all of the lines are really powerfully favorable as well. So this is one of the places in the world, along with the other one across the planet from it, Laos and then and Cambodia and, and Vietnam have a similar combination here, only with the lines pointing in different directions in that area. Now I'm going to show you another map, um, which is actually the map uh, of John F. Kennedy, his map of North America. And this is, a, this is an example of how, and this is going to be one of the maps that I will be covering in my second book about astrocartography. I'll tell you a little bit about the first one in a moment, but the second one is the one that I'll be working on and, and finishing next year. And it's going to be called Maps of Power because it's going to be focusing on political figures, religious figures, other famous figures in the history of our planet, especially recently, in recent centuries. And so this map of John F. Kennedy, you see, is revealing because the lines that you see in his map are really appropriate to the kind of life and the kind of conditions that he had. In the eastern area of the map, which I'm showing you right now, I'm circling the area of Massachusetts, where he was born and uh, um, where, his, uh, where his main power base and family were. What you see near this location, as you notice, is a yellow line with the symbol of the planet Saturn uh, pointing to the top of the map. What this will represent in a person's chart and in his maps is usually a powerful authoritarian father figure in one's life. And so the main problem necessarily for him as a young man, and even for him as a man growing into middle life, was that he was the son of Joseph P. Kennedy who was uh, a person who really intended to run the lives of all the people around him. So that this would clearly was, was one condition that applied to that part of the country. If we look at the other side, however, we notice that going right here close to Los Angeles is a sun line pointing right to the top of the map. Some people regard this as the most favorable line in the map. And it is called by some people the fame line because not only are we likely to attract success, financial rewards, positions of social and perhaps economic and political power, but we gain recognition for who we are and what we do. It's right close to Los Angeles. So no wonder that uh, Kennedy was the, was the favorite of the media establishment in the United States at that time, um, while the country still had independent media who could choose to cover whoever they wanted to, uh, to feature. But in the middle of the country, you see the fatal line there. If you look at the state of Texas, surrounding the city of Dallas, you see two lines here, which I'm going to highlight for you here. One of them is a red Pluto line por forming, pointing to the top of the map. The other is a green Chiron, the healer line, pointing to the bottom since the Pluto line is the line of death and regeneration. It is obvious what the danger of this place was, and the man himself was warned repeatedly about the peril of going to that place. And like a Kennedy, uh, he usually ignored the warnings to his, own, uh, to his own detriment. The other line that is present here, the Chiron, the healer line, involves not only the way that we may act as a medicine practitioner and a healing force in the lives of others, but also the way in which we encounter and experience our own wound. And so the implication of this line then, because the arrow on it is pointing to the West, which is the direction of partnership and relationship and collective conditions, is that this involved the suffering and the inflicting of a wound that infected the entire country. And so this is a very appropriate map then for this man and his experiences and conditions. And this is why, you see, we can apply this really to the, to the lives of almost everyone. I mean, I, I read for people every week now who are naturally interested in um, finding the best places where they can be physically for living and working, and even if they are quite happy, as most people are, to be in the place where they are, they like it there, it's to their advantage to develop relationships with people in other places. 
couple of examples I can give you. Uh, I work with a client in New York. He's a successful professional photographer, and he um, he has tremendous planet lines in Switzerland, especially Geneva. Now he doesn't want to move to 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 Switzerland. He likes it where he is in New York, but he's been building relationships with art galleries and art agents in Geneva, and it's booming. He's selling more of his work there than he does in his home market of New York and New Jersey. And so that's how this works for our benefit. When I wanted to publish my second book, which is called Surfing Aquarius, um, the publisher of my first book turned down the proposal. And so I therefore wanted to concentrate on the area where my next publisher was going to be, so I, I applied to the publishers who were under my Jupiter line that runs through New England. And so naturally the public publisher who bought the book was Red Wheel Wiser in Boston. So we can use these things for our practical advantages all the time, um, you see. And so uh, this is why astrolo uh, astrology is, is becoming a hotter topic, but astrocartography in particular, because people have such a strong sense of place and of where they need to be active and where they, they feel that they are, are most energized and where they're comfortably based. And naturally, I read for women all the time who want to be mothers. And I can show them from where their moon line is pointing, this is the place where you should give birth if you can works all the time. I can show families who have children uh, in the last year of high school and who are contemplating their choice of a university, well, you can go here to Wisconsin and you're going to spend four years in a party and you won't know how to spell university when you get out of there, or you can go over here to, to New Hampshire under a Saturn line and you're going to have a social life that is not nearly so exciting but you're going to apply yourself and learn things that will be of value to you, and you may attract a mentor who's going to be worth diamonds to your future. That information has practical value, you see. And so it all is happening with, you see, Paulette, my understanding of it right now, at a time of profound planetary transformation in which people are understanding our position not only in our local communities, in our country, in our planet as a whole, even within the, the galaxy, within the cosmos. Uh, and we are starting to think of ourselves in much larger terms. And part of the process, really, of spiritual evolution is that our circle of consciousness and concern expands so that we are no longer thinking just about our lover or our mate or our family and our friends. We are thinking about our community. We're thinking about the environment of the earth as a whole. And naturally, what is happening right now as we begin to understand how the planet really works is that we are in transition from an old misunderstanding of our life as living only in a world of things and of fixed, solid, what people call realities. You see, because reality itself comes from the Latin word for thing. That is, a solid, physical thing that defines our life, that we can apprehend with our senses. And this is how people have always thought about this. And if they hear something that is outside of their paradigm, they're immediately going to say, get real. Because what they're saying is, I want you to come back to my system of belief, if it even is a system, you see. But what we are beginning to understand now, and we're finally catching up with what Max Planck had in mind in developing quantum mechanics over a hundred years ago, is that we're not living in a world only of things. We're living in a relationship between solid matter and energy and the interchanges and the transformations of these are happening all the time. The great heroic comedian Bill Hicks once said that matter, or, uh, matter is only energy slowed to a lower rate of vibration. And it's absolutely true, you see. So we are moving now from a planet in which people have always thought we are stuck 
you can't fight City Hall, things are the way they are and they will never change, uh, and so the best that we can do is react as painlessly as we can to conditions that we can't possibly hope to affect to a new way of life in which we have a better understanding of the intentional field, the vibrational field, the way that people sharing the same kind of vibration and the same focus of intention at the same time can indeed produce tangible results on the planet. And this has been pr proved over and over again, you see. And so now it's only a matter of when we are finally going to get with the program and accept what is becoming more and more obvious. Naturally, many people are interested in how they can make astrocartography their own, how they can learn it and practice it for their own purposes, for their families and so on. And there is no uh, quick, easy fix to this. There are astrology programs, or I should say astrocartography programs, that you can order for a PC or a Mac, uh, like the one that I use, which is called EO Edition, I-O for EO, um, published by Time Cycles Research, which produced the color maps that we've seen in this video. Um, and you can buy it as part of a suite of different uh, astro, astro cartography and astrology programs that gives you the ability to do this incredible range of things that a professional astrologer would do. Um, it's going to be an, an investment of a couple of hundred dollars. Um, you can also take the approach of uh, working with one of the websites like astrocartography.com or Astrodienst and you can send them some money and you can give them a set of target locations you want maps for and they print out the, the maps and the interpretations for you but you're still going to be pretty much in the passive position of, of uh, reading what somebody else has prepared. If you want to learn astrocartography, there's no way around it. You've got to learn some basic astrology. Um, naturally, the best way to experience it is to read your maps with a professional astrocartographer who knows the system in detail and who walks you through it, answers your questions, and above all, we hope, is an astrologer whom you like, whom you want to trust and spend your time with, and who ideally is an astrologer who is aiming at the target of love. Because I see two kinds of astrologers in the world, and I've known both types ever since I was a student astrologer in my 30s. There are fear astrologers who are going to tell you what's going to happen if you don't do what they tell you, and there are love astrologers like me who are mainly interested in asking what you want and how we are going to see your best means of getting it and bringing it about. And it's not easy a lot of the time because people have their blockages. They have their resistances. They have their ways of not seeing what is in their sacred contract, which they wrote in the spirit plane before they came here which spells out the mission they're coming to do on Earth, what they're doing for the purpose of their own evolution towards spiritual perfection, and what they're doing toward acting in service to others rather than acting only in service to themselves. Um, it is not an easy process uh, because there is no such thing as a life that is without obstacles and challenges. And the pattern of our life, you see, as an astrologer would see it in terms of this sacred contract, is that we go through periods of difficulty and blockage and suffering, which are designed to purify us from the more egoic motives, so that then when we come through that, we are able to operate in a way that is more generous and loving and wise. And so that's the whole approach that I take as an, as an astrologer. Um, what makes this period of time so immensely exciting, you see, is that as many people have heard and they sort of uh, apprehend indistinctly so far, we're at the cusp of the age of Aquarius, 
which means that the age of Pisces, which came before it, is ending now, and this new age of Aquarius is beginning. This is related to the idea of what is called the Great Year, or the Platonic Year, um, or in the Vedic astrology, that can compare to the cycle of the Yugas, which is this very long cycle of 26,000 years almost, in which the equinox point in the zodiac is moving very, 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 very slowly around the wheel, and if it takes almost 26,000 years to go all the way around, that means every 2,000 years and maybe another 160 years, it is going through one of the zodiac signs. And so this is how in mythic time, the ancient astro uh, astronomers and astrologers like, like Plato and Homer, um, who was known by the Greeks not so much as the poet of the Iliad and the Odyssey, he was known as a teacher of astronomy, who used epic stories as a way of teaching people about the sky. So we know, therefore, we have come to the end of an age that began before the birth of Jesus, and it is ending recently, which was ruled by Pisces the fishes. So no wonder the fish, as the symbol of the Catholic Church, has been dominant. Why organizations of hierarchy, like the Catholic Church, have applied to churches and armies and governments and corporations, all of these things, organizing people's lives and structures in tiers of power and knowledge so that the ones who are at each level understand something about what is below them, but they don't understand anything about what's going on above them. So they are all divided into these different levels that prevent them from becoming knowledgeable and active and free. The point of the age of Aquarius that we are in entering now is that because Aquarius is the sign of revolution, of change, of innovation, of electronic technologies, of relationships of equality, is that these structures of hierarchy are collapsing now into what is called synarchy, which means that everybody is basically at the same level of authority and power, and we all relate to each other as equals. And so things that we're already familiar with, like Facebook, like Skype, like these things, are all part of that change of paradigm right now, you see. And we are going through a time right now which is absolutely crucial to the transition. What is important about this time right now, you see, uh, um, in the history of our planet, especially to me as an Aquarian activist, you see, if I had to describe myself as one thing, among these different things that I've done. That would be the most important now, because it is crucial to me to do whatever I can to assist the awakening and the evolution of our planet toward greater freedom and health and love and prosperity to be shared by all of our people and by the natural world, by the other species who are in this holistic design with us. The years from 2012 to 2016 are crucial because this is a period of time that astrologers think of specifically as a, an alignment of two planets, Uranus, who is the bringer of change and the ruler of the sign of Aquarius, and Pluto, who is the planet of death and regeneration and the ruler of the sign of Scorpio. When these two are in this 90-degree relationship, when they are now, uh, or they're in a relationship of opposition, or they're together in a point of conjunction. This means that these two are pushing against each other and catalyzing and producing an immense amount of change. And so this is the kind of situation that was in effect at the time of the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, the European uh, social unrest and revolutions of the 1840s, the end of the First World War and the Russian Revolution, the events of 1968, 
it comes at intervals of roughly 60 years. So 60 years after, nine, after the 1960s is the period of time we are in now. And so no wonder we are going through such a period when there are so many changes happening on the political level, the economic level, the social level, the spiritual level, everything. But what is different about our period of time right now, which makes our opportunity and our challenge unique, is that we have come to the showdown battle between the people who intend to be free and to love one another and to create beauty and harmony and friendship and the people who intend to control us through fear. And this is why we see the kind of tension that is happening right now on the planet with these endless fear propaganda campaigns, these events like the Paris attacks that took place a few weeks ago, which are obviously a false flag event and which are created specifically by these hidden authorities and controllers who are in fact doing mainly a process of stimulating as much fear as they possibly can. And you see there is a, a sort of other dimension of this behind the surface of what people normally see. Because imagine this, you see, the way that you and I nourish ourselves is that we eat food and drink. And this gives fuel to our bodies and maintains our health. Um, and um, imagine, however, other beings who don't sustain themselves with physical food. They sustain themselves with emotion instead. They live on love or they live on fear. And we can imagine in the universe right now, we are in the middle of a battlefield that partly involves us as the human species and partly involves us as the focus of all these extraterrestrial species who are fighting a proxy war with each other on Earth. We are the battlefield in which these forces of light and freedom all over the universe are on one side and there are forces of suffering and domination and control on the other side. One image of this that I have, you see, it's as though humanity is at the plate in Yankee Stadium and we are at bat and all over the stadium. The stadium is filled with beings from all of these other planets and galaxies who all have their outcome in mind. Some of us want us to hit, some of them want us to hit the ball over the fence and others want us to strike out and look terrible doing it. And that is what is going on right now. So the fact is, you see that these controlling governments and the wealthy established entities that control them they're not after the money at all. They've got all the money they need. But what they are after is to terrify us with the idea that we will lose our money and we will go into fear over that. And there will be a wonderful harvest of fear that they can gather from that. And so this is why this moment we are in now is just so crucially important. And this is why people are waking up more and more and more every day. They are looking through the veil. They are seeing the reality of what is going on. They are seeing how much we have been misled and cheated and dominated and manipulated until now. And so we are in the position, you see, because our focus tends to be local, of really not believing that there are many other people like us who see what's going on. Whereas the fact is, we're in the majority now. And that's why the transformation that we intend is only a matter of time. Because more and more people wake up every day. When they do, they don't go back to sleep. Time is on our side. And this is why the energy is accelerating now. And this is one reason why I take good care of myself. I, I make smoothies with with pineapple or papaya and vegetable juice and, and pollen and, uh, and maca every day so I can live quite a bit longer because I want to I wanna see and help create the new planet that we are in the process of, of bringing about. 
if you imagine, you see, that the, the time that the age of Pisces began, when the great-grandfather of Jesus was a teenager looking for a date, this was a time in our history, you see, at that period during the, the Roman Empire, the, Med, the, the, Middle Eastern, uh, the Middle Eastern countries, other places in, in the part of this, the world, there was this kind of awakening of mystical consciousness, which simply means, really, that we understand the unity and the oneness of all things. This was happening at that time more than 2,000 years ago. Now we are at another transition point. We are among the people who are lucky to be alive uh, at the time when one of these great ages changes into the next one. And it's not just a matter of luck, it's a matter of design. You see, the great uh, baseball executive branch, Ricky, once said that luck is the residue of design. And it's right for us in the sense that we intended this to happen. The power of our own intentionality is much, much greater than most of us understand. And if we understand how great the power of our own individual intentionality is, we can imagine what happens when great numbers of people, even millions of people, share and drive the same intention together. That's why we are at the cusp of change and we are in the process of creating it. And many people believe, as I do, because this is, uh, well, it's something that cannot be strictly verified. It's much more somewhere between a belief and a presupposition. But so many people I meet and know now have a sense that we are coming into reunion in some way. We have known each other before. Uh, and we have had the intention that we are going to meet again and we're going to form another nexus and combination of people and energies at this time. And this is not simply uh, the kind of thing that some people dismiss as New Age nonsense, you see. If you don't believe that we are living in a New Age of some kind, you are asleep because obviously many new things are happening, and there is a great awakening into new consciousness now. We understand more things. We understand things more quickly. We have a chance to master things faster and easier, and we have a sense that the changes that are happening on the Earth now that are the most important are not just changes in technology, and government, and economy, and, and structures. It's the change of consciousness that is the critical thing right now. And so uh, this is why it's so wonderful to be alive at this time. This is why I love to travel all over the world at this point and just talk about these things, because people are receptive to them. And the more there are people who go around um, communicating this to different people, the more we have a sense of how unified and, co and connected we really are, you see. Because talking to each other here locally, we have some sense, you see, of what our own communal connections are. But imagine, you see, people from here going to other places, people from other places coming here, understanding the kinds of things that are happening on the earth that are not being communicated to us at all by these utterly corrupt media uh, that are not conveying news. They're only conveying propaganda and lies. Uh, when I was on my latest book tour, um, one of the places I went, and I'll tell a little story about this, was, was Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, this is during the time when the Occupy movement began. And there were different Occupy movements and encampments in cities all over the country. And what happened in Wisconsin was that the governor of the state uh, introduced legislation which would remove the right of collective bargaining from the public employee unions. And so teachers, firefighters, police, hospital workers, sanitation workers, all of these people would no longer have the right to strike or to bargain collectively in their relations with their employers. And so the teachers immediately occupied the capital of the state. And they went in there and 
the way that they went about this was extremely interesting, you see, because the first thing that they did was that they uh, organized a uh, they organized a janitorial team for purposes of keeping the capital as spotlessly clean as it always was. And the second thing that they did was that they organized a police liaison desk to, for purposes of communicating with the police department about what they were doing and how they were going to go about it. And the police and the firefighters were in the strange position of being exempted from this new law, so they would still have the right of collective bargaining, but the teachers would not. And so they were on the teacher's side. And when the government governor ordered them to remove the teachers from the building, instead of doing that, the police organized a full-dress parade in which they are coming in one door of the Capitol, through the rotunda, out the other side, carrying these boom boxes and radios with march music to declare their solidarity with the strikers. Did this get on the evening news? Of course not. The last thing that they want us to see is that our police are in solidarity with our teachers. The next thing that happens, the Green Bay Packers, who are the most famous unionized workers in Wisconsin, declare solidarity with the strike. Does this get on the news? Does it get on the NFL today? Of course not. And so these are a few of the examples of how this is working in the world right now and how so much of these exciting, creative things that people are doing are being suppressed. And that's why it is so important that we communicate person to person and community to community about this to bypass this screen of lies and obstruction that is going on. Other interesting things that happened, the farmers organized a tractor parade with their kids in face paint and balloons and all of this stuff going around the Capitol building. And the other thing that happened, which was fascinating, you see, there's a, there's a pizza place, like literally within a stone's throw of the Capitol, and someone put online the information about this place, and so suddenly, from all over the world, orders are pouring in, please deliver 12 vegetarian pizzas to the teachers in the Capitol. They're coming in from Japan, Europe, Antarctica, South America, the teachers are getting so much pizza, they don't know what to do with it. Does this get on the news? Of course not. So this is just one small example, you see, of how this is going right now and what our responsibility is, really, as people who can no longer be in the position while our people are being imprisoned, our planet is being poisoned, uh, our people are being poisoned rather than concentrate on all these terrible conditions, you see, because you know very well what they are. Everybody knows what they are. Everybody knows that the state of California recently enacted uh, a mandatory vaccination law. And the implications of this are tremendous, you see. Not only that is that the big pharma establishment is going to do as much as it can to get this legislation enacted nationwide, so that you will not be able to work, you will not be able to travel. I will not be able to go and see my family and friends in the United States because I refuse to be poisoned with vaccinations. And since I can't show a vaccination certificate in time, I will probably not be able to enter the country. And so this is part of the process here that is basically designed to isolate us all from one another. And there's even an internal passport system that's being adopted. So that not only will you not be able to travel from country to country where the United States is concerned, you may find it hard to travel within the country. And so the effect of this then is that instead of allowing us to move and operate freely on the planet, people are divided and isolated from each other. And you can understand, really, how this reinforces the entire objective of keeping people in fear. Because fear divides and isolates. Love unites. And the last thing that they want is to see people united in love. But that's the first thing that I want. Because we understand pretty soon, you see, 
that uh, that love is the most important force. Uh, recently, it was wonderful to see that a letter by Albert Einstein was finally announced. Uh, he willed his con his collection of personal correspondence to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem with the instructions that these would have to be kept secret for a certain amount of time. But the letters were recently revealed, and one of the letters was his firm belief that you see the unifying force in the world, the unified field that he was searching for throughout his life was not a physical condition or a physical formula. The unifying force is love, as Einstein saw it. So basically what we get is then E is not MC squared, E is LC squared. E is love C squared. That is how powerful it is, as that man understood it. So as things like this keep getting revealed, it's so important, ladies and gentlemen, have heart, have courage, love one another, love is unstoppable. And it's so delightful then to be on the planet, even with all of this suffering that we see going on. If we accept the idea of the sacred contract, which is one of the bases of spiritual astrology, we understand that every single person chooses the life they have. They choose the outcomes that they've got. Before we come down here and we incarnate on earth, we negotiate a life role with our soul. We're like an actor or a musician negotiating with a talent agent. And we choose what the job is going to be, what the relationships are, the problems, the obstacles are, all of it. And our life is the working out of a script that we have already written. And we come to the understanding of this, and as soon as we do, when we do, we cross the barrier, we cross the line from being one of those people who are reactive and in fear and blaming other people and wondering why God hates us to being one of those people who understand, I created this. And so the implications of it are pretty profound, you see. You can imagine that a few weeks ago in Paris, every one of those people who were murdered was carrying out their own sacred contract. They agreed that they were going to be in that place, they were going to be shot to death by professional mercenary assassins pretending to be Middle Eastern jihadists. Um, and that was somehow useful to their soul evolution, perhaps paying the debt for the time before when they had killed women and children while they were on crusade, or they had sent as witches and heretics to be burned at the stake, or they had worked for the SS, or they were Henry Kissinger or some. Well, he's still alive, so he, you know, he's going to have his contract to, to carry out later on. I would not like to be in his position. So that's the point, folks. Whatever, whatever contract we are in right now, we are fully responsible for it, and once we understand that, and once we understand the linkages with the other lives that are, that are connected to us, our power to change the scenario is unlimited. It's only a matter of our seeing that we indeed have this ability to do it. So there is nothing to be afraid of. Turn off the TV. Don't listen to the politicians. They're all owned by bankers who are all owned by vicious extraterrestrial reptilian beings. Uh, they're not on your side, okay? But we, as long as we are on the same side with one another, can in time, with right effort, do whatever we intend. A lot of people have the idea that astrology is somehow fatalistic. And the, if they open themselves to it, and they begin to explore it and have another person lay it out for them, they are going to find out how they are trapped in some situation that they can't possibly change. This is not the correct view to have about this, you see. We have the ability to change anything. There is no such thing as a good condition in your astrology chart that is going to benefit you unless you find it and tap it and use it. And there is no such thing as a limiting or difficult condition that you cannot transform. 
with the right effort, you see. This is why when I read for people, what I will look at when I am focusing on conditions of timing in their planet transits is that I will show them this is a condition that has a limiting effect on you for this particular period of time, and it's useful to be aware of it and to find out how you can best work with it while you are in it. Because if I fail to mention that to them, and I'm giving them this sort of rosy reading that, that leaves the challenging things out, I would be doing a disservice to them. But everything happens in the rhythm of our life, as astrology is reflected, um, which alternates between conditions of limitation and difficulty and conditions of opportunity and progress. And so I focus on both of them. I can tell people, I, I had a reading with a woman yesterday who's, what, 27 years old and has the courage at this point in her life to put herself through several different really challenging conditions all at the same time. And I look at a chart like this, and I feel I'm in the presence of courage here. And what can one do but admire this person and support her, you see? And so what I had to tell her was that for the next two years, from now through the end of 2017, you are going to have intervals that have the effect of putting you through processes of death and transformation. Not that you are literally going to die, but that something in you that is an old habit or an old belief or something else that you no longer need that is holding you back is being unloaded so that you are free to move toward what you intend. At the same time, there are these other conditions here that offer you really wonderful opportunities. Here is where you produce the wonderful creative results. Here is where you have opportunity for relationship, including indeed a new love relationship, if you are open to that. Here is where you go after the communications and the media. You update your website, and uh, and we. Uh, speaking of the new media, uh, yeah. So anyway, you're you're hearing the sound of a Peruvian cell phone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, this will pass away in a moment here, you see. But the point is uh, that there is no such thing as astrology if, unless a person is in fear, unless they're determined to believe this, as, as so many people are. So many people will say, ooh, I don't want to find out what's going to happen because their expectations are fearful and negative. My expectations are loving and brilliant. That's what I focus on. That's why I get more popular as an astrologer. And, the, and when people see these outcomes manifesting in their life, it's not just that I look good as an astrologer. They look good to themselves in a way that they did not look before. So that's the critical thing. And we understand in the large range of our life and our progress from one life to another that these periods of limitation and difficulty and suffering are absolutely necessary. We chose them because before we come to the next point of creativity and opportunity, we need to purify ourselves of everything that is petty and mean and unloving and fearful so that we evolve to the next stage of being most true to ourselves and most true and useful to the other lives we serve. It, when in doubt, if you are thinking about working with an astrologer, you just make the decision. Do you like this person? Do you want to spend time with them? That's the crucial thing. Going to an astrologer should not have in your mind the image of going to the dentist and having someone drilling in your teeth. That's not the point. That's not what astrologers are for. We are focused on your best possibilities. That is when we are people who really ought to be practicing astrology and are honestly on our game. Um, but the point is that we're too in a process of ongoing perfection from one life to another. Uh, and evolving in that direction. So don't be afraid of astrology. Be afraid of the things that are getting in your way. 
and ideally don't be I shouldn't say be afraid of anything uh, you see just but but please understand if we have resistances to something very often the thing that we are resisting is not something that's objectively difficult it's something that we don't want to accept right now because it's going to require some kind of awakening and effort from us that we don't want to make it's inevitable folks so be ready be ready choose choose an astrologer you like even better learn astrology yourself uh, this beautiful woman that I'm talking to here, Paulette Waltz, who is fil filming this, is one of the students in an astrology class that we teach here in PSOC uh, every week with my colleague Michael Morris. The best way to learn astrology, if you're interested, form a love relationship with another person who likes astrology too. That's how I did it. When I was a younger man, what could be better Spend time with your beloved, have dinner, talk about astrology, make love. Talk about astrology a little more before you sleep, because the, those moments before you sleep are the best time to learn anything anyway, as, as actors know. That's why we study our lines right at, right at that point. Um, so the main, the main focus is, is love. Use love to assist your objectives. No better way to learn astrology. That's why in this class people keep pairing up with each other, and when they do, they tend to be on the fast track. And they, uh, they, they learn astrology a lot faster than the, than the others do. So if you, if you want to understand the age of Aquarius a little better and how it applies to you specifically, one of the resources that you can use is my book, which is called Surfing Aquarius. Uh, and it is astrology related in the sense that the early chapters in the book tell you uh, something about what the age of Aquarius signifies, what are the qualities of this zodiac sign and its ruling planet, and the way that this great age, like all of the others, introduces its own new technologies, its own social and political systems and ideas, and so on. But the book is not mainly an astrology book. It's a self-help and self-guidance book, because most of the chapters are about things like the Aquarian economy, the Aquarian revolution, Aquarian love relationships, Aquarian spirituality, the Aquarian planet, Aquarian medicine. All of these things, if we understand them better, give us the ability to operate more gracefully and spontaneously within really fluid conditions. The title comes from the fact that really at this time, as we are moving and traveling through the age of Aquarius, we're like a person on a surfboard, working more with their feet than with their head and just responding from moment to moment with what the currents are and where they're going. Um, so that is, is one thing that's available to you. That's, the, um, that's one book which is actually the the one that is doing well of the ones that I've published. It's also been translated into Spanish as uh, Navegando por Acuario. My latest book, which was published in August, is called Finding Your Best Places, and it's uh, published on Amazon Create Space, so it's available as a printed book, which you see right here. Uh, also, it'll soon be available as a Kindle edition too for people who prefer that. And the book is really an introduction to astrocartography and it tells the stories of 21 different people as reflected in their maps of different parts of the planet. How some of them moved from places that were really not good for them at all and realized much better outcomes once they moved to other places that were more favorable to them. And how the opposite scenario occurred, that people who were in conditions of comfort chose to move to places that were challenging for them instead. People who did not want to move from where they, are, they were, but found it advantageous to create lifelines with, with um, planet lines in other places where important relationships are available to them, and so on. The interesting story about this book, one of them, is that I ordered a case of copies of the book uh, in September, and it has finally arrived here in Peru now, three months later. Why did it take so long? 
especially because UPS, which tends to do its job pretty well, um, was, was the deliverer of the book because it was held up for by the Ministry of Foreign Relations in Peru because it has maps in it. The way that this kind of governmental, bureaucratic, fear-bound, control-bound ma mind thinks is that any map in the book is probably going to give an enemy uh, information that they need to bomb Lima Airport or to invade Peru from the Brazilian jungle or whatever they're thinking of. This is how they operate, you see. And this is typical of what we are going through right now because the closer we come to freedom, the more these authorities are going to try to clamp their controls on us. Happening all the time now. This is just a little example. Finally, the book is here. Uh, and uh, you can you can order it from Amazon if it uh, if it looks good and sounds relevant to you. And I will be doing a series of other books like this as well. One of which is going to be the the astrocartography of historical events. You see, because one very interesting thing happened when I was in Egypt in 2011, a few months after the Egyptian Revolution which began on January 25th of that year. And I read for a couple, and the, uh, the husband asked me, what if you created some maps for Cairo on January 25th? And so I just cast a set of maps for like eight different ones, from like 8 in the morning, 10 o'clock, noon, 1 in the afternoon, and so on, and just took the people through this set of maps and interpreted what should have been going on in Cairo at these specific intervals of time, and they said that's exactly how it happened. So imagine the implications of that. You see, astrocartography now is a historical research tool. One thing that I'm practicing the discipline not to investigate yet is the day in 44 BC when Julius Caesar was assassinated. What if I create maps of Rome during that day? What if I create maps of September 11th, maps of the day Lincoln was shot, maps of, the map, maps of the stock market crash in New York, and so on? I mean, all of these things could help us reconstruct not only the event itself, but also the spinning and reporting and distorting of the event as it is reported throughout the world. You see, I did an astrocartograph of the, of the November attacks in Paris, um, for the time at 9.20 in the evening when the attacks occurred in these different places. And what you see is a line of Mars and also a line of the Moon's node, the communal line, flanking the city at very close distance, which means there's a violent event happening at that time, and there is also this kind of communal feeling of outrage and grief and sympathy, not only among the French right in that area, but also by people all over the world who are in compassion for those people and their loved ones. You can see it. It's right there in the map. What's the relationship between free will and between conditions that restrict our freedom and, and give us only limited uh, abilities to move and operate? And both, both are necessarily involved, you see. And uh, I would not uh, be foolish enough to, to say that all of the weight in the scale goes on one side or another, because our lives are interdependent. Uh, I, I forget who was the man who created the famous image of the, the stroke of a butterfly wing in Brazil, creating these, 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 uh, the, these, these reactions and results in some other place on the planet. We are all so connected that our free will necessarily has relationship to the actions and the will of other people. Um, and so necessarily then, um, we, I believe we can operate just most happily and successfully within the understanding that if my actions are loving and truthful and powerful and courageous and kind, then I have not only my best ability to operate freely myself, but I contribute to the freedom of others in doing that. 
Um, but yes, this is a this is an excellent point that you've raised here because um, figure that these lines, these planet lines, as they exist on the planet, that represent the positions and relationships of all the planets at a particular time, are are circling the Earth. The, they're circling the Earth, or more accurately, the Earth is rotating in relationship to the lines. So every line makes a circuit around the Earth every 24 hours. And that's why if you look at the same thing or every at intervals of time, you can see how the changes are occurring. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, you see with this same Paris map, you have one set of lines that are flanking the city of Paris. You have another set of lines in New York and Washington, D.C., showing you very clearly how people who are organizing and orchestrating this event are producing a shocking outcome for purposes of fear-controlling propaganda, and they are projecting it onto the planet through state-of-the-art media. Um, you, can, you can see these things happening, really, in connection with any event. This is why a lot of what I do, if people want me to want me to estimate the best date and time for them to do a marriage ceremony is I look not only at their astrology charts, I look at their maps. And I see at this particular time you have in this place, Colorado or wherever it is, this is the ideal alignment. Um, I did a, um, a chart and map for the Cairo Institute of Health and Well-Being. We, sh we showed them that. This is the particular period of time when you want to launch your initiative. And it, and it, happens, it, it happens all the time, you see. So uh, um, we are really in the position of having in front of our, our, ourselves so many amazing resources of perception and knowledge if we will only open to them and understand what is available to us. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the people, uh, um, perhaps, who are, who are watching this right now understand the famous image of the cave in Pluto's Republic, or Plato's Republic, Pluto's Republic, they are substituting the planet. But, but the idea there is, you see, and the reason why the image is so compelling is that people are seated on the floor of a cave, they are fastened or chained there, the only thing that they can see is the back wall of the cave. Uh, and light is coming in from the outside, and people are walking past the entrance to the cave holding up different objects. And so people are seeing on the, uh, on the back wall the shadows of things which they take to be the things themselves. And one guy escapes, he goes out and describes what's really there. These are not just flat, black shapes there. They have depth, they have three dimensions, and they have things... I can't even tell you what color is until you actually see it for yourself. And they, they want to attack this guy and kill him because he has aroused something that is just so visceral, viscerally afraid of, of absorbing some kind of new knowledge. But we have no choice now. There has recently been a study in the United States uh, that Barbara Ehrenreich wrote an article about, about how American men in the middle age range of 45 to 55 are dying now at an alarmingly faster rate than they normally did before. And not surprisingly, because those are the people who are most stuck in their habits of ignorance, refusing to absorb anything new, refusing to learn new skills, refusing to consider that their opinions might not really reflect the world at all as it is. They are stuck in this ignorance and in this economic hardship. They are very often uh, pharmaceutical medicine dependent. It's harmful. This kind of ignorance is killing people right now. And I don't tell you this in order to scare you because you're not an ignorant person. But you are probably a person who has some compassion for those who are undergoing this kind of suffering unnecessarily. So given the choice between suffering and dying uh, from 
uh, from pharmaceutical medicines, from foods tainted with genetically modified um, genetically modified seeds produced by the corporation that must not be named, or on the other hand, taking responsibility for your health and what you can do to, to assist the awakening of your family and your people and your planet, which way are you going to go? It's decision time.